to take the floor. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jua. I um, just joined the new SP postdoc this year, and I'm starting to work with uh, the food and water nexus issue. Uh, so it's about today's presentation. So um, to start with, I will give a, like a very short uh, uh, introduction of myself. So uh, I, uh, I got my bachelor degree from a background of atmospheric science in Manjo University. And then in one year, I did an exchange student at the University of Reading, working with uh, Dr. Sue Grimond on urban meteorology. And uh, I have had my PhD degree in uh, from University of Saskatchewan on a global institute for water security. And my supervisor is Dr. Yan Ping Li, working on a convection permitting model. And uh, in the last few years, as uh, Lu Ling said, uh, introduced, I've been uh, had a long time uh, uh, research collaboration with the REL and HAP group, uh, working with Fei, Mike, and Shanghai on the uh, land and atmosphere, uh, land surface model, working with groundwater and crop modelings. And now I'm starting the new SP postdoc with REL, working on the, uh, the food and water nexus. So after work, I will li I like uh, outdoor life, like uh, hiking, Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, this was uh, Boulder Boulder in 2018, and uh, skiing in uh, Canadian Rockies, the Lake Louise is a very fantastic place and I encourage everybody to visit. Have you paid for the trip? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you have icon pass, you can enjoy five days there. Okay, yeah. Uh, before I start my presentation today, I want to give an acknowledgement to all these great and fantastic people that I have worked the uh, advanced and uh, opportunity to work with. And uh, yeah, now we can start today's talk. Hello, so, Joe. Okay. Hi, Joe. Hi. Can, can I interject for a minute, if you allow? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you, Joe, and welcome your board. Um, so I just saw Mishi Lashort joining us as a special guest, I guess. Oh, uh, I don't know, Mishi, you are still online? Yes. Oh, uh, I am online, except where I am, I cannot talk much, but I am online. But thank you, Faye. Yeah, I, I just wonder if you can just give a one minute introduction of yourself. Oh, yes, uh, let me just give me one second. Um, I have just to get out where I am. Um, Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Michel Asho, and I'm an assistant professor in the agribusiness program at Florida a and University, and I'm also one of the 2021 uh, NCAR innovators. Um, my work is with NCAR is on climate change adaptation. Uh, the idea is to see how farmers' behaviors and also technological progress could contribute to minimize the effect of climate change. Great. Yeah, great. Uh, great, Michelle. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Hello? Yes, we can hear you. So I'm just in the street, so that's why I said I could not talk more. Thank you. Thank you, Mishi, for your introduction. Uh -oh. Yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah, actually, today's presentation, in today's presentation, the last part, uh, we will hear about uh, my work on uh, oh, climate could change you, and hello? education on agriculture. Yeah. Oh, okay. Faye, do you want to say anything more? No, no, no. I just want to oh, use... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I said I'm in this suit. I could not talk more much. Oh, okay. Could you hear me? Yeah, yeah, that, that's good, Mishi. Thanks, thanks for your introduction. I just want to introduce you to Zhou and to this group because uh, uh, in the future, Zhou and other people will work, okay, collaborate with you. Thanks. Okay, no, thank you very much. I, I would have want to miss this opportunity. And I said, even if I'm somewhere, I cannot talk, but I'm going to try to attend. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Right. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, as I said, the last part of my talk will touch on uh, climate change impact and 
uh, the agricultural adaptation. So yeah, so uh, I want to start with a very large picture, the global picture of water and food capacity in the world. So this figure comes from uh, Rodel 2018 about uh, the GRACE group has conducted the last uh, 15 years of the water, uh, terrestrial water trends in uh, globally. And then they're trying to attribute to the blue colors representing uh, gaining water getting wet and the red color representing the water are losing or declining. So you can see that a lot of the places where the, are the food producing region had this declining to terrestrial water uh, storage in the world. For example, in uh, California, the Southern Great Plain, the US, uh, the Middle East, Northern India, and also the North China Plain. And then just how many years is this? This is 15 years. The gray says 15 one. years. Yeah. Groundwater or groundwater? It's ground. Uh, it's a terrestrial water storage. So it's like the total column, including snow, glacier, what, uh, soil moisture. Yeah. What's interesting about this figure is that uh, in California, the northern, Cal the middle of California, northern California is red. Yeah. And that's where all the wildfires are. Yeah. Yeah. They also, it's the, the groundwater pumping occurs. Yeah. But it looks like Saskatchewan has got too much water. That's right. I, I will talk about it. Why, why is that? Yeah, I, I, I will talk about it. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. And then at the same time, it yeah. looks like too much snow. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> at the same time, the, the GWAX had started these uh, grand challenges for the three main regions for the water for food basket of the world study. And then uh, one of it, it's the high plain in the North America. So uh, my study sits right into this North America uh, water basket region. So uh, I want to take a zoom in to original look at what are really happening. That's uh, Roy pointed out that uh, in this region, we have the high or the major production region of corn, soybean, and wheat, but they are facing very different water issue. So uh, the blue here at the Northern Great Plain and the Canadian prairies are uh, actually having too much water. And then uh, also they have these uh, small potholes, wetlands there, and uh, right next to the cropland. So the farmers there would need to drain those wetlands allowed they to have planting in the springs. But in the south, you can see that the, uh, the California Central Valley and the Northern Great Plains, they have too little waters. So the farmers would need to, uh, the landowner would need to pump as much of water from groundwater. and causing the, uh, the water declining. So these uh, complex issue will call for a diverse management strategy. So uh, today's presentation. So, so can I make a, a quick comment for yeah. Faye, Faye Chen? Uh, Faye, we may want to put some of this in the BAMS paper. Which BAMS paper? You're talking about uh, the, the first yeah, four, four, four. four. Okay, so because I know you have a lamp of BAMS paper in mind. <laughs> this is the 404 paper that you're working on right now. Okay. Uh, over the continental U.S. Anyways, yeah, I think you're part of that. that yeah, sounds activity. a good idea. Yeah. And uh, oh, sorry, that's right. And uh, so today's presentation, I will have uh, three projects introduced. So first is the wetland project uh, associated with the water security. Uh, focusing on these small pothole wetlands in the Northern Great Plain. And the second project will be uh, the food security, focusing on modeling the uh, joint modeling of crop and irrigation. And the last one I would talk about the climate change and mitigation. So uh, each about 10 minutes, and then finally wrap up with a uh, future study. It's about a uh, 40 minute presentation. So, uh, so to start with, I also want to uh, Acknowledge that my study regions. So uh, here, I'm looking at the Great Plain, where you have this different boxes and color: the prairie pothole region, the rain-fed corn and soybean, and irrigated soybean and corn. I also want to highlight that uh, the benefits I'm using uh, from the convection permitting model forcing, with uh, two forcing here: the Conus One and Conus Four Four projects. To, uh, they have the similar domain setup, but uh, different time period and different uh, boundary, boundary uh, conditions. 
uh, the benefits of using convection permitting model, they have like very high resolution and then trying to improve the precipitation, uh, precipitation uh, representation and also the surface property uh, in the model. So uh, to start, let's take a look at the, um, the first study, the wetland project. So if you fly to Saskatchewan, you will see the small potholes from the sky. And the location, they're located across the US and Canada broad borders. These wetlands have uh, a small in scale, but um, numerous in number, and they're located right next to croplands. So they are facing threats from climate change and cropland expansions and wetland drainages. So the purpose of this study is trying to understand the water cycle and then the wetlands feedback to regional climate in order to persuade or convince the local landowners there are actually some benefits from the wetland and then to better preserve them rather than drain them. So uh, what forms these potholes? Uh, is this from the leftover from the glacier melt? Exactly. This uh, from like uh, 11,000 years ago with the retreat of glacier, they left over a lot of the uh, composition, the deposition on the soil that's like a five to six meters deep. And then- uh, is, is the water salty or is- No, no, it's fresh water. It's fresh water. Yeah, it's fresh so, water. So the water quality is good. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, so to first look at what are the important processes in here in the wetlands. So to put it simple, it's called field and spill. So in the spring, you have snow melts and rainfall that fit into the wetland as inflow. The water stays in the wetland and evaporate to the atmosphere. And finally, they, uh, if the water are exceeding the capacity, it becomes runoff. But how are these processes represented right now in Wolf or NOIMP? <clears throat> so in Wolf and NOIMP, for example, here is a diagram of uh, hue slope grid salt that the blue portion are for the uh, water table depth, and then within this portion, you have a separate saturated fraction called F-set. Uh, it's based on the exponential function of the maximum uh, saturated fraction and the water table depth. So uh, it's uh, so for the water goes to the uh, saturated fraction, it becomes the uh, saturated excess info, uh, runoff, and then the one minus F-set portion will goes to uh, infiltration. And now there's no, and the D4 and OMP doesn't have a storage to collect these runoff and just lump them run away. So it wouldn't be uh, good for a uh, wetland. So how are these models actually represented, parameterized in the model? Actually not very good. It was, uh, so I took from the GIEMS, it's a global product of inundation, uh, looking at the maximum extent seasonality and the maximum of the month where you see the maximum extent can actually go to uh, from zero to uh, 0 0.7 or eight in the, this low lying region. The seasonality shows how many of the months that are uh, inundated and the maximum of the month is from March to June. So the spring to summertime. So the model produced, uh, uh, you can look at the red dash line is the default offset parameterization compared to the satellite data where you see that the D4 FSAT doesn't ca capture well this large seasonal variation in the maximum area of the saturated area. So the first step to do is to modify such um, modification uh, parameterization. To do this, we look at the, the four layer soil moisture and the soil ice from the lab where you can see the soil water has a good, the first layer of soil water has a good correlation compared to the uh, the remote sensing data where when it goes deeper that uh, our relation starts to fade away. So I, then I propose to use a new parameterization where to based on a first layer of soil moisture instead of the exponential function of water table depth. And then that's the result of the green dots where you see it's had a good correlation between well, compare with the, uh, the red lines. I'm sorry, the, the black line from remote sensing. The second step is to have this storage actually in NOIMP. So on the left is a D4 NOIMP where you have the FSAT portion runoff, runaway, and then one minus FSAT goes through infiltration. The new wetland scheme, I want to highlight these two processes. The first is uh, what I talk about, the uh, new parameterization, and then uh, of the FSAT. The other one is that we created this W cap 
so water capacity trying to collect this inflow from snow melt and runoff and then let it evaporate with potential rate and then water exceeding it becomes the outflow. We implemented in the NOIMP and uh, WOLF model. To, uh, in order to do so, we also need two parameters. The first is called uh, the maximum assets uh, fractions derived from the remote sensing data. And the other one is the maximum capacity, where uh, it's from 90 meter DEM, where you will see the majority of the wetland are in uh, about less than 1.5 meter at a four kilometer grid, aggregated to four kilometer grid from 90 meters. And in some hilly region or the topography where the, um, you will see that the topo uh, has a higher uh, capacity. So we run this model offline for uh, thir 13 years using the CONUS forcing, and then uh, do uh, three years of couple simulation with both implementing to study the regional climate. So start with the MODIS data, to start with the offline results. <laughs> We we'll first look at the MODIS comparison. So these are the differences between wetland minus if we don't have wetlands. So here are showing the differences uh, compared also the scatter plot with MODIS. Where you see uh, throughout from, March, from May to June and July, August, it's about 30 to 40 millimeter per month of the increase of total ET compared to uh, no wetland, especially the highest increase are in the northeast of Domain where they have the highest asset region. And the scatter plot, we see that the MODIS ET, uh, I, I separate it into two different seasons and uh, spring and summer, where you see the spring is usually overestimated, but the summer month, the red dots uh, for the wetland case has a better improvement compared to no wetland that's underestimated in the summer month. The other part I want to mention is this great uh, terrestrial water storage as an increasing so, trend. So can I ask a quick question? Why, is, why do you have a vertical line in the red dots in that upper right plot? It, it seems like it's all the 50 millimeters. Oh, was... you mean this one? 50 millimeter. Yes, yes. It's, I think like, I mean, it, it doesn't, it's not an overwhelming result in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's like, it actually depends on, yeah, it's, it's about, so my, 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 my response would be like, uh, we are trying to contrasting like a with or without, and then the with uh, without wetland simulation that you have you seen this with spring and summer you have this contour but trying to look at the uh, improve improve it looks like no mp goes from 20 to 80 and uh, whereas modus is, sticks around 55. i guess there's a resolution issue or detection yeah okay. the lower limit of the okay. yeah, sorry keep and, going. and also difference is between also because the uh ter the landscape because uh, it will have, so we're here, we are more focusing on the water surface, but also MODIS has, uh, or the new IMP has other issue uh, with modeling the grassland ET, because the majority of the Southern region are grassland. So they might be need to like isolate uh, comparing to, we do it here in the original average, but that's a good point. I, I will keep it in mind. And uh, to keep going is that the next slide, the bottom result here is shows an increasing trend from the GRACE terrestrial water storage, which is manifest in the, uh, the GRACE red circles in the bottom figure. And then trying to compare it, if you look into the annual cycle from uh, the month, uh, from the hydrological uh, years from October to August, you will see the wet red lines has the largest impact of terrestrial water storage from March to June. So those are the exact months where these wetlands are stay active. And these are acting these additional terms, making a better comparison with the gray sets line at the regional scale, especially in the spring and summer months. And the next slide I will show is the, oh yeah, I highlighted in the month. The next slide I will show is the, uh, the couple run with the cooling effect, trying to highlight the reduce. So uh, we, if we have the experience with Kona simulation, that's with uh, the D4 simulation has the long lasting, long standing warm biases issue in the summer month. That was showing in the D4 simulation. 
And then when I Im implemented the wetland simulation, that's the second role that shows a much alleviate, uh, alleviated the warm biases in the summer. And to contrasting the warm biases, the cooling effect, the WS or the wetland skins adds the uh, cooling effect in the wetland area, especially in the northeastern part of domain for one to 1 1.5 degrees cooling. That's contributing to the uh, wetland. Uh, the next slide I will show is the coupling issue of uh, the coupling results from uh, the wetlands interacting with lower atmosphere, including clouds and boundary layer height. So here I'm showing the, the results from um, cloud fraction, wetland minus no wetland for different months, June, July, August, May, June, July, August. And then you will see these two lines here, two uh, dash line showing the cross sessions location where you see in from that uh, the lower clouds that's corresponding to about uh, thousand meters uh, where you can see they all have the uh, lower cloud fraction increase uh, throughout the months but most strongly in May. Uh, the, we also compared it with the uh, PBL height with uh, the scatter plots the x-axis showing the differences in soil moisture and the y-axis to PBL height. The result in this figure it was, can be interpreted that uh, the wetter of the soil moisture, the lower the PBL height, where you can see that the majority, the colors are representing the density, where you see the most of the uh, points or most of the regions have uh, boundary layer heights about 300 meters lowering uh, with the wetland simulations. The most strongest impact I will show is in May. And then another two, four, three months that uh, a lot of results will go back to zero com contrasting. But the, uh, but the differences in soil moisture and boundary layer height are evident and that this negative correlation. So here I will give a summary from what we learned from so far. The wetlands, the D4 study neglects surface wetlands. And by adding the wetland, we can help to increase the ET and uh, WTS especially this cooling and humidify effect and interact with lower clouds and boundary layer height. There are some limitations with maybe the hydrological studies that uh, I've received comments about we're not doing this fine resolution of the individual wetland processes are hard to represent, especially the field and spill processes. And also the surface water and groundwater connections, uh, which is very simplified in this scheme. But I want to highlight is the implication or the application is very evident that this cooling effect to the atmosphere, especially to extreme heat wave years, are beneficial to both people and the crops. The figure on the left showing a drain score is a qualitative mapping of how many area and how intense their drains across Canadian prairies. You can see that the highest drain score is very much disappeared and across the region. And it would be a convincing uh, evidence to tell the local landowners to preserve these wetlands. So, and say, uh, have you compared these? These are interesting results. Have you compared them to the studies by Alan Betts? He's looked at the uh, over the Can Canadian boreal forest, at least. He's looked at the clouds and the PBL, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, Alan Batts. I think I met. You, you may want to look at look up his some of his papers and compare. Right, right, right. Like what? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he might have done some similar results. Right, right. Thank, thanks for the suggestion. Okay, so um, now we can move into the second study in the U.S. Corn Belt. We do this at a joint modeling for crop growth and irrigation. The, the, motiv the motivation for this study is also uh, very straightforward. Despite there's a growing trend in the crop growth in the last few uh, decades, the water plays a too much or too little water plays a dramatic role in this intraannual variability. And in the US, more than one third of the water are used for irrigation. So the science question we have here are what are needed to reasonably represent or simulate this both crop yield and irrigation? To do this, we use the NOIMP crop model and with irrigation implementation. So the NOIMP crop model has three components. I, I try to make it simple. It, 
is it calculates the photosynthesis and carbon assimilation at the leaf level using the PSN. And then um, on the left hand side is the crop model. It's accumulating through growing degree days through these eight different stages. Uh, across different stages, you will have this. Um, across these stages, depends on which stage you're in, the crop will uh, allocate carbon to different parts of the crop body, for example, stains, roots, grain, and leaf. The model was initially developed by corn and soybean uh, by Xing Liu in 2016 in the US. And now I'm also working on a wheat model under review in the Canadian prairies. Uh, for, the, for the irrigation study, uh, it's also uh, the irrigation amounts based on a soil water deficit, which means that you proceed, uh, prescribe a soil moisture uh, threshold under which the uh, irrigation scheme will be triggered. So it will act as the added to the uh, precipitation for saying how much of the water you need. So here it provides the USGS county level uh, water withdrawal data for uh, the calibration. So this work was done by uh, Xiao Yu. So what I did is trying to put this two model, crop model and irrigation model together. Can we do a joint simulation and what are the results like? To do this, we also need, before I start, I need to introduce some crop, some necessary data uh, sets. It's like uh, uh, crop fractions and crop yield data you have obtained from USDA and then an irrigation fraction and irrigation amount data from uh, MODIS and the USGS water estimate. Another part that's critical is the planting and harvesting area uh, date. So these are comes from the USDA uh, field crop usual planting date. So the survey data give you by every each state a planting window, most popular corn and soybean, red and red for soybean, blue for corn. Um, but these are like the most popular windows. We have to make an arbitrary decision by the um, the middle of the uh, the window, and then propagate it to different states on the figure. That's the figure you can see on the right. It's a state level planting and harvest. So before we have the uniform planting, now it's a variation across different states. Okay, so we do this for five years in uh, from 2000 to 2004 using uh, the data observation data. We do three sets of simulation. The bulk is meaning three sets, bulk and bulk irrigation is out of the box, no calibration. And then the state and state IRR irrigation is state level planting and harvest data. Uh, to show the impacts of from the planting calendar. And the last one is the 0.5 nitrogen, which is uh, half, we reduce the amount of nitrogen by half to assess the impact of nitrogen stress. Okay, now we can look at the, uh, the crop U First of all, and the most important is the crop yield data. The crop yield you can see on the top is the USDA county level yield and the, uh, from corn at the left and soybean on the right. Where you can see that's reasonable and then the, four, uh, the six sets of simulation at the bottom. There's usually uh, a reasonable corn and soybean uh, simulated in the ring fed region. But if you don't have irrigation, that's it will under predict the irrigated region for uh, uh, Nebraska for corn and the lower Mississippi River Valley for soybean. The state applying the state level planting and harvest day reduce the crop yield a little bit. That's because uh, the state level usually delaying the planting and then um, as a less yield uh, compared to the bulk simulation. And lastly is the half nitrogen where you see a huge decline in crop yield. And then with irrigation, doesn't have much help, which corresponds- well, Say, can you re repeat what bulk and state and mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I that's okay. Yeah, way. bulk is like out of box. It's no, no product tuning. No tuning? No tuning. With the uh, crop? With model. the crop model, yeah. And then the state is that we use the state level planting and harvesting date. So it's the impact of uh, variation in the planting calendar. Okay, the ca planting calendar. Okay. Yeah, so uh, so I was explaining that you delaying, the, base, the state level usually is delaying a little bit of the planting you have, uh, and then the crop you would de decrease. 
And then the lastly, it was to have nitrogen, which at that point, uh, nitrogen stress outplay water stress. So even though you put as much of water you want, you can't have a better yield. That's for the crop yield results. The next step is to look at the irrigation results. So on the left is the USGS uh, water withdrawal data for irrigation at county level. We want to highlight the model of uh, representation on the right. We want to highlight two regions. So uh, the red for corn uh, for Nebraska and uh, the blue for uh, lower Mississippi River Basin, where you can see uh, the two, the scatter plots are for different counties, the 90, 93 counties, Nebraska, and multiple counties in uh, River Mississippi, where you can see that in Nebraska, no, usually it's the corn that made up a lot of the total irrigation, and for soybean, it's more uh, a major contributor in lower Mississippi. Uh, and um, soybean apparently use much more water compared to uh, corn. And lastly, I will provide a summary of this crop model study by this plot. Um, you see that I grouped this into three different, uh, four different categories. You will see the, uh, the USDA data on the left. And then by contrasting uh, the bulk and the bulk irrigation, that's the impact from irrigation. Where we can see for corn, if you put on the right amount of irrigation, a crop yield can increase about doubling about of the amount. But for soybean, it's not as evident, it's about one third of the amount. And the state, as I introduced, is usually lowering a bit of the introduced compared to the, uh, the bulk simulation. But that's the, uh, the best uh, uh, state planting and harvesting data survey uh, obtained from the USDA. And lastly is the nitrogen stage. So the nitrogen uh, implication is also clear that you have multiple stress, water stress and nitrogen stress. In order to for one stress to uh, to play dominant impact, you have to manifest it through the other interplay, like uh, from the other uh, stress from nitrogen. So lastly, to accurately simulate crop, you what we need, we need crop map, irrigation map, irrigation schemes, and also parameter calibration, sufficient nitrogen fertilizer. And lastly, I will highlight here is the accurate crop calendar, which will be the topic of my my next study. So now that we have looked at the crop, the, the modeling capacity to uh, simulate a crop yield and water use, we want to ask what are the climate change impact to this fragile food and water system and what are the potential mitigation strategy? To do this, um, a lot of previous study trying to assess climate change, they use uh, global models. So you put into multiple ensemble of GCNs with uh, multiple emission scenarios plus the crop model at global scale. Uh, they have multiple ensembles of realism, but the disadvantage or uh, deficiency is that they do not resolve these short-term extremes and the course resolution at 50 kilometers and have very simple uh, management prioritizations. Um, what I want to highlight here is that we use a new approach. We use the convection permitting model forcing. It has the better climate forcing, high resolution, I also want to highlight the two forcing uh, I was used in this study. The Colonus 404 has the reliable forcing, and the PGW and the Colonus 1 has the PGW future climate scenarios, which allows us to have a detailed processes understanding uh, what's really going on in the crop model. And the NOAA MP model has the like the thesis in crop growth and agricultural management. But before I start. I will look at, I presented this in AGU where we see the Colonus 1 comparison with Colonus 1 forcing and Colonus 404 forcing. With the dry run of, or with the uh, initial result of Colonus 1, you can see that compared to USDA, it has the large crop you underestimate in the Midwest region and also uh, has uh, exaggerated the uh, interannual variability on the right figure. And then I did that with the Colonus 404 forcing to do. Uh, you can see not only it can improve the crop yield not only in the spatial distribution but also on the uh, much stable time series. So uh, you can see that Colonus 404 has this better forcing, but it doesn't have a future climate. And then Colonus 1 has the future climate, but the forcing is not good. What do we do? 
we're starting future today. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Good to know. Then. But so we'll have the answer in eleven months. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> but but to start to have a, we do a like a shortcut bias correction, for using Colmus four four as a reference data and Colmus one, PGW. We do it very simply to do a linear regression. So how to do this? Oh, it's not showing. Okay, it's showing. It's we calculated the month, uh, the monthly at mean temperature and precipitation, the 13 years, 12 months, you get 156 month sample. We take this 13 years climatology for each month and do the linear regression. So if you can see, we obtain that uh, the slope and intercept from uh, the figure below, where you can see uh, the 156 sample on the left and then the 13 year average on the right. So uh, after bias correction, that's the blue dots, uh, BC after it, and it has a better one-to-one uh, -one ratio on uh, compared to the original. We apply this method to every hour time step forcing and every grid point for both core, uh, control and PGW. That's the uh, regression slope and regression intercepts. The important aspect, the important uh, take from this is that, for example, in the Midwest, where you have the higher slope, it will be scaled up to for precipitation for 1.2. And then in Ontario and Mississippi, the precipitation will be scaled down, then plus a positive intercept. It's, it's been doing it through different uh, pro every grid point and every hour for both control and pitch up. Okay, so now we have complete the forcing part. We want to know what's really going on to the crop projection. So first of all is the corn yield at the rain fed region. On the left is the current, on the right is, on the middle is the future change, and the right is the comparison of daily yield. So we can see that hatched region, like the crossed region, are have the reliable or reasonable comparison with the USDA county level yield, where the dotted region in the middle figure shows a significant change larger than 30% of decrease. And then on the, on the right figure, you can see the most of the rain fed region, um, the blue bar for control climate has a reasonable comparison with the gray bar from USDA data. But the red bar from future climate has significantly declined for under the PGW scenarios. And what's surprised to see is in the irrigated region where you can see that the corn yield uh, the corn yield will also uh, significantly declining where you see the irrigation amount, projected irrigation amount has largely increased about, uh, as you can see from the large red bar. So that's, uh, it would be a threatening or interesting story it would be for the, the, crop, the corn yield will reduce by half despite you have the increase of the irrigation demand. We try to understand what's really going on uh, PGW scenario. So we do a very quick analysis on uh, an index called frost-free days. So it's the daily average temperature warmer than zero degree. That's a frost-free day. You have from current climate to PGW climate, we have about 40 to 60 more days of, um, of frost-free days, basically allowing the growing season to expand from the both ends. But it also induced a prolonged and intensified drying, where you can see I'm calculating the P minus PED. That's the water availability uh, for different months from March to August. For both rain fed region and irrigated region, you have the strong declining of PHW uh, water availability, and most strongly in the summer months in, Ju in June and July. Last, and then, Given this, given this uh, scenario or the threatening, what can we do? So here I'm proposed to use an early planting strategy. <laughs> so remember the current climate or PGW climate use the same crop calendar, that's the state level. But what, we, what I propose here to use a dynamic running average temperature threshold to, for planting, that's the called a TABE, and then it's larger than 15 degrees Celsius, and then start planting and then use it uh, at, accumulated PG, uh, GGD threshold for harvest. So the figure on the bottom, you can on the left, you can see that's the state level planting and harvest date uh, from uh, date of year, uh, grouping into different uh, states and colors. 
And at the bottom is the uh, TABE, that the dynamic planting calendars from full corn and har harvest on the right. On the right hand side, you can see the scattered that the gray bar showing the growing the growing season, that's the fixed growing season in the states. And then the scattered plot shows the dynamic planting usually starts earlier, um, 20 days earlier, and the harvest will uh, be earlier for uh, 50 to 60 days. If we implement these early planting strategies, what are the benefits? So here I'm showing you the benefit. So to do this, uh, we try we try to model with the PHW climate with the early planting. You can see the crop yield increased about 90 to 80 uh, grains per meter square. To translate that, that's about um, 10 to 10 to 20 percent of the uh, annual yield compared to uh, to current climates. That's the bulk crop yield increase. And on the right hand side, I'm showing the increase also in the irrigated water use efficiency. That's the ratio between the dry land, irrigated yield minus the dry land yield divided by the irrigation amount. So the Im implementation for that, the implication for that is how if you put into a much amount of water, how much it will contribute it to dry land uh, comparison to dry land yield. That's the contribution of irrigation. We do this by comparing the ratio of this early planting and without early planting. The ratio is about 1.3 to 1.9 percent, uh, 1.9 ratio higher. That means you put into one amount of water, you will get 1.3 to 1.9 amount of increase of the crop yield. That's making the irrigation more efficient by doing this early planting. And lastly, I want to show, explain what's really happening by these uh, scatter plots, the benefits of the early planting. Um, so here I'm showing the, the scatter plots of the growing season temperature and growing season precipitation uh, for these three scenarios. Uh, the current climate, you have uh, scatter. So basically you see this negative correlation, but then the PGW are have the most strong impact to move the growing season into a warmer and drier regime. While if we can effectively early plant, it can avoid, it can basically shift back a bit to a wetter and a cooler compared to if we do nothing. And the next is we look at the crop you, uh, the, the growing season length and soil moisture. The growing season length are in this uh, bar for the three different scenarios where the most important, I want to highlight the most important are these initial, the third and the fourth one, the initial rep reproductive and to maturity. That's the stage the crop actually start to accumulate biomass. And you can see that the, the future climate or the PHW has large decline of soy moisture in starting um, July to August. And that's part of corresponding to this uh, crop uh, reproductive stage. That means you have the crop are actually the most, the, the, the period of time that needs most water, but then you, you receive this declining. When we see in the, T, uh, the TABE or the early planting scenario is that we effectively, by early planting earlier, you effectively avoid this large declining of soil moisture or the driest part of the year and already finish, just wait to harvest. And the lastly, I will look at the LAI, which is the leaf area index of how index for how uh, plants are grow, and lastly, the grain yield. You can see that uh, the current climate, the, the highest LAI value is in July, but then the PGW is shrink to uh, small uh, to a small LAI amount and bring it much earlier. But if we print, if we plant the uh, uh, the crop earlier, it will, of course, have an earlier LEI peak, but much larger compared to, but larger LEI compared to uh, the PGW alone. And the crop yield, finally, we see that uh, the PGW scenario should have a large decline of crop yield by uh, 40%, but by doing the uh, planting, early planting, you can have this large uh, implementation compared to if we do nothing. So the, uh, how much does, is this all irrigation water or does natural precipitation play a role here? 
Yeah, yeah. So here is the natural precipitation. Here, uh, if you see the figure on the left, that's showing the growing season temperature because, and growing season precipitation. Because uh, from control of the PTW, the natural precipitation shifts. That's right. And, and, and the diurnal cycle shifts too. Um, Have you looked at the diurnal cycle? Uh, no, no, no. I don't look. I haven't looked at the. Um, That'd be interesting to look at too. cycle. So, but but uh, Kristen and I wrote a paper on the precipitation shift, and what you 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 see is you get less intense precipitation in PGW and more at the at the extremes. You know, the heavy precipitation. But it could be that these it could be geographically lo located. So the lighter precipitation in, G in PGW, I think is in the central US, which could have a direct impact on what you're, we are showing here. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a great point. So, so here I, I look at the growing season, like accumulated precipitation within the season. So uh, the point trying to make here is that, yeah, PGW, of course, it has the total amount of precipitation less than control and also a warmer climate. But what's different is that the early planting is look at, oh, it's get warmer and it's get drier. But we select a period that's more suitable for crop growing. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And yeah, that's the most part of the presentation and trying to summarize. So previous model, global model might be too pessimistic. And then other global study also look at the improvement. But here I'm also demonstrating the key point is to the benefit also to irrigation water use. So it's like a one stone two bird strategies that you can uh, help to both food security and water security. One of the benefits of the convector permitting is it has hourly output. So you can do the general cycle. Yeah, 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 of course. That, that would be great. Yeah, of course. Um, I, I will talk about the, uh, the future study plans. Very okay. Quick. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, and uh, I guess what you were going to do. Yeah, yeah. So there are some limitations. For example, last year we see a very wet spring in uh, both US and Canada, but that will impact, impact the fuel workability. And also, many of the results or more results are inherent model dependent. So there might be a different way of prioritization. But the application is very clear, is to have the beneficial to both food and water security. And that's my last slide. I will look at future work. So yeah, Rory mentioned that the CONUS 404, we have this long-term 40 years data. What are, the question is that, what are necessary to actually capture this year-to-year intervention variability for to, in the long-term RCM? Could be foreseen, we need to do, understand better the processes and also parameter tuning. And then also the other part I want to talk about is this dynamic crop and irrigation in a technique called a wolf a water waker tracer. It's a, a, physicist, a professor from uh, Gonzalo and his student had uh, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This uh, water tagging capacity to look so at. Uh, say, uh, maybe we can stop here and take questions. Oh, okay. Sure, sure. So, of course. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Any, any, any questions from the from the from the group in, in the room or on the online? We actually have a couple questions. Oh, okay. well, three questions. And he has a question too. So, just, uh, so you you bringing up an adaptation mechanism, which is early planting. Yeah. Is there any? Um, I mean, any adaptation also that could involve changing the kind of crop or the, you know, moving to another crop that is more resilient to, to climate or change or something like that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, that's right. I will talk about that. That's, um, so, yeah. So here I'm showing that's because um, I'm doing the, like the modeling study. So in the model, we don't, uh, we will yeah. play around with the, uh, yeah. the planting date. But uh, if we want to do like uh, the variety change, that will have to be incorporated to like a model parameter change. But I'm aware uh, in many of the field study, field study or budget, uh, biogenetic study that trying to bring the, uh, the, the breeds from a warmer area, for example, the wheat in Mexico that, or India that has a better uh, 
hot tolerance yeah. to bring it to um, like a northern area. But also there's some migrating of the crop too. For example, crop are usually planted in the Midwest in the US, but uh, there are some uh, debates, a discussion about like uh, in the Canadian prairies, they could be growing corns in the future. That's like, uh, yeah, some discussion. Interesting for adaptation. Yeah. The bottom line is you implement those plan kind of a mechanism in your crop model, you're able to simulate the response of those changes. Yeah. yeah. Right, then we have online questions. Yeah, you can read it out. And then let yeah, me... yeah, okay. Yeah, the first question is, do you anticipate any additional costs for early planting strategy? Yeah, of course. And then the second one, how do you get the data from Columbus 1 corrected for regression analysis? If that make, if that, if it's possible, that make, might be some initial costs related to water use efficiency, use of better equipment. Yes, uh, thanks, Mich uh, Miche, for this question. I, I, I pointed out here is one of the limitations, like the weather spring, that's the cost. So um, I, want to, I want to bring it up here as the discussion uh, I had with, uh, with our group of Ronnie and something before, is that, for example, last year in Saskatchewan or in Canadian Prairie or in the Midwest, it's very wet. We have snow in in April and, and May. So at that point, the, the, the soil are very wet and soggy so that uh, the farmers can't have the tractors going to the field. They have to put a belt on it. That's an additional cost. You have the, like, you need to have some equipment or, and also that's, uh, uh, we had also had the discussion or the some initial results where trying to show a statistical relationship for the planting area and the early spring precipitation. You have, for example, you have a very very wet spring precipitation. Then the planting area will reduce because there's less work uh, workability. So that's the very large cost. But that's the uncertainty we don't know. But Trying to hear is like a proof of concept that if we do that, it can be a, a good uh, mitigation. How do you get a data for corrective for the, if that makes sense? I'm not quite sure what was the question. Is that possible that might be some initial cost? Uh, so, I mean, you have your regression and, and on this, you know, the right hand side, you have the con us and you're trying to correct it but the left hand side variable how do you create this variable oh okay i i cannot hear you um, oh i think i think so yeah i will move back to that is are you asking for this page yes this page yes yeah so here uh, because so the colonus one is more of a dry drier and and warmer compared to the real case uh, like uh, in the reality or the observation and then the colonus 404 is the better it always a newer version and longer version of colonus one that uh, has more realistic uh, precipitation. That's a uh, big ratio. So the point here is to have to bring it, but Columbus 404 didn't have the future uh, scenario, but Columbus 1 had it. So we did the to bias correct. So here it has some assumption. For example, this relationship stay the same until in the same scenario, yeah, but. Well, I think the broad equation there is a little bit confusing. Oh, okay. You, you, you are showing the next step, you, you, how you calculate the corrected one, but uh, actually people are thinking about uh, the regression equation. So oh, I see. So you should put a corner four for it on the left hand side of the equation. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, thank you. That's right. Uh, that's right, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Okay. Can you hear us, Bay? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I, I, it's I, your turn. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I just have a quick comment. That's very good questions on the Mishi. 
you ask, or just for the group of information, Mishe is a part of the Anka Innovator okay, uh, program, has been working with uh, Tom uh, Hudson and other people on the <coughs> agricultural economy climate okay, nexus. So all these cost questions, we really want to get uh, some of your 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 input, okay, your insightful information about how you know this things, you know, the water use and the compromise or trade-off okay in the crop yields, how that translated into the economic values. Okay. I mean if you do irrigation, for instance, as a adaptation strategy, it's going to cost energy. Okay, it's going to cost money. That's for sure. So this type of all this kind of intel kind of a play among water yield and economy will be interesting. I, I hope. I think Tom Tom Hobson, I think he's a PO two. He's a, going to set up a meeting. So uh, we we'll probably have a more detailed discussion about this. But Michelle, just for you, I mean, this is probably the first kind of a, well nice. overview of you know Taylor's work. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Michelle, for the question. The wetlands. Um, the slides that you were talking about, the soil moistures and uh, BPO high. Um, and the slide. So for, for most of the plots, I think the R square and the general pattern is not really showing a, a strong relation, especially the, the top plots, the scatter plots. So what are your comments on what are other variables that are making a difference in these two cases? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, so here are I actually trying to highlight this like two parts. So one is the uh, so the scatter plots and the uh, linear regressions are showing the uh, showing the correlation between the x axis like the soil moisture and late uh, and the PPL height, meaning the wetter the soil, the lowering the. But what I also try to highlight in the fix, the first figure here is that you want to look at the color of the dots. That's the density of how much portion of the domain that are uh, implement or has the most change. So what I hear here is that it has the uh, negative 200 PBL height comparing to uh, no wetland case. So if that. No. You see that R square is like around 0.2, so almost like no no relation. It's just like what, what are the other factors that are are paying role in this scenario? Yeah, we're at four. So if anybody has uh, other duty to go, and it's great to have you here, and we'll have a discussion with Jura in the future. So yeah, we'll continue discussion in the room, and you're welcome to stay to listen in. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I see your point. It's a very low R square number. Yeah. Uh, but I think George's point is it, once you implement a wetland, you have a systematic decrease of PBOI, no matter yeah. how differences are. So that's kind of the main point you would like to make, right? Oh, yeah. And also, I want to make a comment because uh, you will see this are uh, progressing through time from spring to summer. So I, I, I'm spec speculating that it's coming from a shift of regime from an energy limited to a water limited mm -hmm. regime. So you see in the summer month and uh, July and August that the correlation are much stronger. So it's uh, as, you, as you mentioned that what other factor like radiation might be a big player in the first month. I actually have a related question. So how in the cold, how do you um, account for the additional evaporation from the wetland? Is it's very simple, actually. It's similar to what no MP is doing. So no MP has the vegetated so, fraction yeah. and uh, and uh, bare land fraction. So I, on top of that, I put a like an F set, and then with the water, I put it in like a one, uh, like an F set 
times the potential evaporation, and then the other part has its own one minus F set portion of evaporation. So maybe, hold on, we might want to end the meeting <laughs> oh, in case, yeah. So thank you everybody for joining yeah. us. And I think we'll have some offline discussion now because uh, those questions are a little bit too detailed. So thank you for coming and have a good weekend, everybody. Bye. Bye, everybody.